And tonight marks the season opener for our Friends Forum, a series for curious minds, sponsored by the Friends of the University of Minnesota Libraries uh, and brought to you through their generosity and support of members. Now, before we begin, I'd like to share some information that is important to all of us. Uh, as you know, the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus is located on a traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. An acknowledgement of this complex and layered history is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and the community about the land and our relationships with it and with each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Now tonight we also acknowledge that education is complex and ever-changing. And here at the university, uh, we're looking at new ways to teach and to learn. And the classrooms of yesterday were comprised of desks in rows and chalkboards and perhaps a pencil sharpener. But today, our desks are mobile, our classrooms are technology enhanced, and our students are connected with multiple hand devices and others. And it was just 14 years ago that YouTube joined the social media milieu and has had increasingly profound effect on the way we teach and the way we learn. And significantly, whether you're a university student or whether you are a long-retired great-grandparent, the opportunity to learn through this medium is as close as your television, your computer, or your smartphone. Now, our speakers tonight, Regents Professor Peter Reich and his son Alex Reich, have created two educational YouTube channels, Minute Earth and Hot Mess, a PBS YouTube channel. And both of these are complex, they take complex concepts in science and give us short, impactful videos with simple language and engaging graphics. Minute Earth explores diverse topics such as how infections work, why exercise is hard, and intriguingly, why we should invest in rat massage. And I, I actually watched this one, it, it's worth watching. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to invest, but... Hot Mess addresses the many facets of global warming, which are of great concern, of course, to all of us. So who are these magicians behind the screen? Peter Reich is an international leader in ecological, environmental, and plant sciences, and among the most frequently cited researchers in his field in the world. He's Regents Professor, which is the highest honor the university bestows to faculty and distinguished McKnight University professor in the Department of Forest Resources and the College of Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resource Sciences. Alex Reich has a BA in biology from Grinnell College and spent a year in the Arctic on a Watson Fellowship, learning about the local impacts of climate change and globalization as seen through the diets and traditional harvesting activities of indigenous, indigenous northern peoples. He earned his master's here at the University of Minnesota where he studied the future of global meat consumption. I think we can expect both an entertaining and an educational evening. So let's begin by welcoming Peter and Alex. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you to the Friends of the Library for having us here on this occasion. And thank you as well for the acknowledgement, especially given that today happens to be Columbus or Indigenous Peoples Day. So I'm Alex. I'm Peter. And we have a talk about serious and silly things and how we can make a difference. Well, as you all know, uh, humans and nature face a lot of human-driven challenges, including climate change, but also war, pollution, hunger, disinformation, and many others. And like many of you in the audience and folks around the world, we ask ourselves, how can we make a difference? Well, one way we're trying to do that is through communication, and that's why we've been involved in these YouTube channels. 
So today we're going to share with you about what we're trying to do, which is foster a love for science and better stewardship of our planet through short and engaging online science videos, tell you how we do it and where we think it might go. And so we're going to be talking about the internet, but really what we're talking about is human communication. And that has not changed necessarily so much over time. And so 500 years ago or even 200 years ago, this is what the internet might have looked like. And in some ways, this is what the internet still looks like, which is a bunch of people saying things and it being jumbled and no one, no one knows which way's up. But we are indeed talking about online video. And one of the main platforms, as Wendy mentioned, for this is YouTube. So I'd like a show of hands. I'd like you to raise your hand if you've ever watched a YouTube video. OK. And in just a moment, I'd like you to find someone next to you and in less than 20 seconds, tell them what you use YouTube for and what impact it has made on you. And then we'll give you a 20 second uh, time to switch. And then after the whole 40 second period, we'll ask you to share a little bit with the audience if you want. And there'll be microphones going around. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor and share with them about why you use YouTube and what impact it makes. 45, give him 25 seconds. I just, okay. Hmm? Oh, okay. At least, I'd love to hear all the people saying. You forgot to thank everyone, we'll do it later. <laughs> thank okay. everyone for coming. Well, thank the, the, um, Got you on. All right, we'd encourage you to switch, and if the second person can share with the first why you use YouTube and what impact it makes. Okay, everyone. Well, if you're willing to share with the wider group how you use YouTube and what impact it has made on you, would you be willing to raise your hand and Lanaya would come and share? Yes, we have someone, someone up here in the front. Very enthused. Oh, just and wait for the microphone, please, if you're willing. You can watch funny stuff. <laughs> Good. Good answer. Anyone else? Um, yes, in the back. I wanted to know how to tie a bow tie when my son went to prom. <laughs> Very good. I watch a lot of educational um, information on the, it, it's just fascinating to me. I do a lot of, of things around food and farming and gardening and health and wellness and sustainability issues. And uh, my, my husband was the other speaker here, and he says he loves it because the organization he works with, Minnesota Renewable Energy, posts all their talks. They have once a month, and they have it for 13, 15 years. They have their YouTubes up on, on the web, and he said a lot of people hear of the organization and are drawn to it from just watching those YouTube videos. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, yes, over here. And then we'll have one more in the front here, this, this lady. Um, I'm 92 years old, but trying to keep up with the cyber world. And I've been watching a series on the history of Rome. And there are many things in there about how the climate changed as uh, Caesar moved into Gaul. Wonderful. Yes. Well, two things I can learn to, I'm, if I don't know how to fix my car, or my car engine, and the other thing was that there's this fantastic series of Yale physics um, lectures. Wonderful, well thank you all for sharing. Um, as, so as you can see, there's a variety of things that people use YouTube and the internet for, and it really is a sort of democratization of 
knowledge and knowledge sharing, and in some ways, we represent just one, of, one very small niche of what kinds of things people can put on the internet, and on YouTube in particular. Um, and with that in mind, we're going to be talking just about our own channels. And there are you know, these five channels. And for every one of these channels, there are 10 or 100 other channels that are equally good and cover things such as the physics of sailing, or the science of cooking, or the history of of, of Rome and the Incas, and we're, imagine us as sort of representing, if you will, the tip of the iceberg of what kinds of things exist out there for us to learn and see and um, experience on this particular platform. Well, I'm going to have us take a step backwards now and think about how we cooked up the idea of getting involved in environmentally themed science videos. Well. My son, Henry, who's up there now and is Alex's brother, this is a picture of him in Los Angeles in 2011 when he was uh, in film school after he finished a master's in theoretical physics. And he started making videos about physics and math and putting them up on YouTube under the Minute Physics channel. And they started getting a lot of views. And at the same time, I was in the Arctic trying to understand how indigenous people's lives were being impacted by climate change and globalizing forces. And one day, I was chatting with Henry, and he was up too late. And I, I was in Siberia, and he was in Los Angeles. And one of the things we chatted about was Minute Physics and how well it was going as the, on the vanguard sort of, of this platform and using it for this educational purpose. And we ended up talking about the idea of doing it for Earth and ended up um, deciding to make this channel called Minute Earth. So what are our goals for Minute Earth, or what were those goals when we began, which largely have remained the same? They include inspiring people to care about science, disseminating the real science behind environmental issues, inspiring people to care about the environment, sharing a sense of wonder, creating something beautiful, and last but not least, whoops, it disappeared on us, change the world. And to make this happen, we needed to build a team because the three of us were all involved in other day jobs, whether it was making physics videos or being in, in Siberia and then in grad school or me at the university here. So we had to build a team. And you can see a depiction of that there in our stick figures. Uh, but we're actually real people not just 2D stick figures. And you'll hear more about our team in a little bit. So eight years, almost to the day, from the original time. And we've made over 180 videos. And they cover a dozen or more broad topic areas that include climate change and climate, that include conservation, biology, and geology. that include food and agriculture, that include human health, and that also include some silly topics that also all have at their core some important and serious scientific concepts, whether it's the um, human evolution or how naming a different organism, a, a different type of name, can make it more likely to go extinct or more likely to be saved and why apple pie is an American, one of my favorite topics, which is how most of our food actually didn't, wasn't domesticated here. So all of the ingredients for pizza were domesticated outside of Italy. And all the ingredients for apple pie, none of them came from North America. And so to give you the full experience, let me ask you this. How many of you have watched a Minute Earth video? If you can raise your hand if you have. Wonderful. Well, thank you for watching. Please continue. Um, <laughs> But to give you all who haven't watched and those who have the full Minute Earth experience, we wanted to play you one of our videos. And it's called The Secret Weapon That Could Help Save Bees. And uh, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, but we, we made this video and, and many of our others in partnership with the University of Minnesota. And as you know, Peter's a professor. I was a graduate student here, and I'm now just beginning to be a visiting scholar at the Institute on the Environment. And the university has been core to our ability to work both in terms of interactions with the incredible experts at the university system, and then also with this is, this is sort of knowledge-based work. So the library resources are fantastic. 
So anyway, the video is called The Secret Weapon That Could Help Save Bees. It's about three minutes long. Hi, this is Alex from Minute Earth. Each spring in California, so many almond trees put out flowers at the same time that local bees can't pollinate them all. So almond farmers pay beekeepers to bring bees from all over the country at exactly the moment the trees flower. That might seem crazy, but almonds and other bee pollinated crops are worth $17 billion a year. So it's worth it to farmers and to beekeepers who make more money renting out their bees than selling honey. Unfortunately, when we bring so many bees together, parasites and diseases easily spread from one bee colony to another. And when bees feed on just one type of crop at a time, they don't get all the vitamins and minerals they need. What's more, the honeybees can get sickened by the pesticides that keep crops safe from other insects. As a result of all this, since 1960, the number of commercial bees in the US has fallen by half. And since so many crops require bees for pollination, and farmers are planting more crops every year to keep up with demand, if bee numbers continue to drop, it could jeopardize our future food supply. But we're learning how to help bees. Beekeepers and farmers are working together to reduce bees' exposure to pesticides. Nonprofits and bee lovers are planting more wildflowers across the landscape, so commercial and wild bees have a more diverse diet. And universities are breeding parasite and disease-resistant bees. And we can also help bees fight parasites with a chemical weapon they already have in their own arsenal, propolis. Honeybees in the wild smear this substance inside their nests, which sanitizes them and keeps intruders out. To make propolis, bees visit trees and collect resins rich in flavonoids and aromatic acids, which are toxic to many organisms. Then they mix the resins with wax, making a sticky antibiotic glue. Bees in commercial hives also make propolis, but they use it only to seal gaps and don't smear it on the inside walls, probably because the walls are smoother than the inside of a tree. In these hives, bee larvae often get sick. But if you build a hive out of rough, unfinished lumber, or attach plastic pieces filled with holes to the walls, bees spread way more propolis, and their larvae suffer way fewer infections. So beekeepers are starting to rough up their own beehives to encourage their bees to spread propolis. This helps the bees stay healthy and keeps them pollinating crops and making honey. That is a sweet solution. So how do we actually go from the initial germinative idea to a finished video like this? Well, we mentioned earlier that we're a team and we all have different skills and expertise, and we all contribute different things to making Minute Earth work, logistically, as a business, and as a community based around our stories. We have writers, editors, directors, animators, producers, uh, business managers, and I've probably forgotten something, uh, and many people wear two or three hats along the way. Uh, so we want to give you a sense of the logistics with a behind-the-scenes look at how we make Minute Earth. And this is Henry, my brother. Yeah, so he couldn't be here in person. We'll give him a chance to speak in two dimensions. Hey, this is Henry. I am here to talk about how Minute Earth videos get made. We are a truly internet-based uh, production company. We have, at times, spanned eight time zones. So we communicate using tools like Slack and Dropbox and Google Hangouts and a bunch of other things for file sharing and working together and collaborating on a creative project across the world. Minute Earth videos begin as an idea or a uh, pitch from somebody, one of our writers, who is excited about something and wants to share it. And they tell the rest of us about it and we ask questions and get normally also excited about it. They go off and learn more about it and do research and come back with the draft. In the research process, writers will either read books or scientific papers to learn about the material themselves or they'll talk to researchers to find out what's kind of the newest thing in the field or try to really get a better sense of understanding of the subject. So then we have an iterative process of revisions and drafts and revisions and drafts that sometimes involves conversations between an editor uh, and the writer or feedback from the entire team. Then at the end we do a little bit of tidying up of the writing and it goes off to the narrator and they narrate the video. Then we send the audio to Ever who does the audio editing and so he'll cut the narration down from a bunch of takes, often with mistakes, into something that sounds good and is part of the video. And we must not forget that at this point we also add music to the video as well. Then we go into storyboarding where the illustrator for the video will do kind of really rough sketches for what is going to happen in each scene of the video. 
we will have several iterations of video storyboards where we're trying to get feedback from everyone and the writer in particular, but also everyone on the team as to how we can best visually convey the material we're talking about. Only once we've zeroed in on where we're going with the storyboard do we then have the illustrator do the final fancy looking drawings. We invariably have multiple revisions at that stage as well, but because the final drawings take more time, we try to get as close to the ideal video as possible in the storyboard stage so we don't have to spend as much time doing the illustrations and changing illustrations that we already spent lots of time doing. Finally, once the video is done, we will post it online on places like Vessel and YouTube so that you can watch it which is, I assume, where you're watching this video. This might sound like a long and convoluted process, but it's made extra complicated by the fact that we are actually doing this in parallel for up to eight videos at a time. Some are in stages of writing, some are in stages of storyboarding and illustration, so that we can have videos ready to go at more regular intervals. Hopefully you've enjoyed that little behind-the-scenes look at how Minute Earth is made. Have a good one. So it's also important to make Minute Earth financially work. And there are three main ways that we do that, for those who are curious. Um, the, main, the first one is through advertising revenue on YouTube. So when you watch a video and there's an advertisement before it or on the side, we get a very, very, very small portion of, of uh, money for every advertisement that's shown to viewers. Um, but a much more important source is partnerships. We've had an ongoing partnership with the Grand Challenges Initiative at the university also. Um, and we've worked with a number of foundations, like the Heisen Simons Foundation, as well as a lot of uh, other nonprofits and organizations. Every year for the last couple of years, we've worked with Bill and Melinda Gates on their annual letter about how the world is getting better. And we've made a video in association with that and the work that's being done to make it better even going forward. And Another important source of funding for us is crowdfunding. So that's you. We are supported by people like you who watch our videos and say, hey, this is kind of like listening to the radio, and it takes money, and it's kind of a public service because it's about something that I care about and that really matters for the world, and it isn't necessarily going to get as many eyeballs as the Super Bowl or something else like that, and I'm going to give 5 or $10 per video. So if everyone here gave $10 to Minute Earth for every video we made, we would probably be able to hire another person and make more videos or make better videos. So Patreon.com is an important part of our ability to keep on making this weird and random uh, thing that is online educational videos on YouTube about environment and science. So also important to Minute Earth is to make the stories work. So we'd like to share really briefly what we think are some best practices and how to address complex issues in short, entertaining, and factually accurate stories. Number one, say what you mean and don't dither because we only have two or three minutes. Another is to respect your audience. Don't assume that they know a lot about exactly what you're discussing, we'll say the chemistry of the cement making process, but do assume that they're intelligent and can understand it if, if it's explained to them and if they're brought through it in a way that can help them learn. Number three, be honest. Respect what the facts are saying. And number four, make it a story. Humans love stories. We work based on stories. So often we start with a question or a, a problem or an idea. Say that the concrete that is underneath the floor that we're all standing on or sitting on is a big source of carbon emissions. And then we highlight something unexpected but important about it, that, that the cement that makes that concrete stick together is actually the source of 8% of all of humanity's carbon emissions, just from the cement that keeps together the sand that you're sitting on. And then if it's a solution-oriented story rather than just an interesting story, we would try to say what we can do about it and say, oh, there's ways to design buildings and uh, roads and things that use 60% less cement, like the 35E bridge, which actually had 95% less or 90% less carbon emissions um, than it could have had because when it was rebuilt in 2008, they used zero emissions cement. So that's what those wavy things are kind of symbolizing. And then the idea is to end with something positive, which is there are alternative cements or there are you know, cements that can be used that, don't, that actually sequester carbon. And if we work hard at it, we can make it work. So people don't like to be left with 
the world is ending and it's all bad. <laughs> and number five is a bunch of other stuff too numerous to talk about. And also, because this is education, we wanted to put up an example of a really bad slide that has way too much text on it. <laughs> so we have a simple challenge for you all. Write a sentence using five words that answers the following question. What is a pencil? So take a few minutes in your head, or excuse me, if, if, take a minute in your head and think of a sentence that describes what is a pencil. And if you, if you have a pencil or a phone and can write it down, please do that. And then we'll ask people to share in about 30 seconds if anyone wants to share. Five words. Five words. What is a pencil? All right. If you think you've been able to describe what a pencil is, raise your hand, and we'll have a microphone come around. Yes, in the back. Cylindrical, sharpened, idea capturer. Very nice. I'm um, here in the front as well. Oh, just, if you'd wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. It's a small yellow stick. Very Whoa. apt. That's so funny. A couple more. Come here. Come here. Um, wooden stick filled with graphite. Very nice. Wooden stick filled with graphite. Yes, here. It's a mark maker. Something for making marks. Very nice. Yes, in the back there. A wooden utensil with lead. A wooden pencil with lead. Very nice. Tool to record changeable information. One more time. Uh, tool to record changeable information. Very nice. Well, those are all fantastic definitions. And they're all different is the interesting thing. You know, here are some we came up with. Erasable graphite writing tool. That's only four words. What are we doing? We're not even following <laughs> our own rules. Thin wooden graphite drawing utensil. Graphite rod and wood casing. I guess it's better if you're even shorter than five. Peaceful graphite weapon of democracy. So <laughs> these are all very different sentences that describe the same thing, but they convey something very different about it. And that's an important lesson, that how, what words we use and what aspect of something we decide to describe really is what that thing is to us. Well, now that you've practiced a little bit, uh, we're going to give you a slightly tougher challenge. In one sentence, answer the question, what is climate change and what can we do about it? <laughs> so take a, a minute to think about that and then compare. We'll give you a minute and then you can compare with your neighbor. And it can be as many words as you want as long as it's one sentence. So turn to someone next to you and share what you have so far for describing climate change and what we can do about it in one sentence. We'll have about a minute or so for this. Should I call on that girl or 
she just raising her hand? She's calling someone else. She's already answered twice. It's great that she's excited. Okay, um, this is a little more challenging than the prior, I think. So anyone want to volunteer what they, there's a person out there who raised their hand right away. And wait for the mic. Please, yes. If you would. Climate change is the emergent symptom of human behavior and the solution lies in our mind. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, very way in the back there. I am about halfway through in my sentence. It says, uh, human greed has been channeled through top-down societies to gather maximum wealth for the few from people's labor and the earth. And then I'm going to get into the solution. <laughs> <laughs> dot, dot, dot. Very nice. <laughs> Uh, climate change is the observed change in climate uh, due to man-caused phenomena, um, the, res uh, the solution to which uh, involves the reduction in use of fossil fuels and other systematic change. Very nice. Raise your hand. Anyone else? Here in front. An unfolding ecological catastrophe caused by burgeoning human population and consumption that requires a global Green New Deal. Very nice. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Those are all great answers and all different. OK. So now we've given you a sense of why and how we make Minute Earth, uh, what some of our videos might look like, and given you a chance to practice uh, some script ideas for Minute Earth. We'd like to pivot back more explicitly to our involvement in Minute Earth and ask, what have we accomplished and where do we go from here? Well, what we do know is that we have 180 videos and counting, dozens of partnerships, and averaging 4 million views per month over the last six years, about 300 million in total. And that includes about 85% in English, but about 15% in Portuguese uh, and Spanish uh, translation versions and a variety of other languages, such as French and Arabic. So we often ask ourselves, what is success? What does it mean to be successful? Does it mean that we have lots of views on the videos that we make? Does it mean that a middle schooler and the world's foremost expert on the topic of the video both watch the video and really like it? Does it mean financial stability for our team and the ability to keep on making these types of videos? Or does it just mean that people are entertained? I think the answer is yes to all of these things. And we have a deeper interest, which is the idea of changing people's lives in the very small way that we individually can do, but in a way that the power of ideas has a great capacity to do. And it's also the idea of making a more sustainable planet. Again, doing what we can do as individuals to catalyze the types of changes you're all describing in your description of, say, climate change in one sentence. And this relates to food, how we get it from land, how we get it from the seas. It relates to population and cities and urbanization. It relates to the materials that we use and how we can make them more sustainable. And we ask ourselves a lot of questions in the making of all this. What's the line between edutainment and real teaching? And by the way, we'd love your feedback on some of these questions at the end when we have a Q&A session. 
We also ask, should science communicators be activists or educators? This is actually a big tension among our team. It's caused actually a lot of angst over time, uh, and we can maybe chat about that later, but it's an important question, we think. What about scientists? Do they or we have a responsibility as science communicators, activists, educators, and maybe advocates? Do videos like ours actually accomplish anything? And if so, what? And where should we go from here? Well, we started this talk by asking how we can make a difference. And although we've made videos on a wide range, a dozen or so sets of topics, sustainability and climate change have been two of the main themes. We've made more than three dozen videos about them. And we want to share with you some of the ways we've tried to make such videos and make an impact. So one way is to try to make things more personal and describe our own experiences rather than be sort of bodiless voices of knowledge intellectualizing and saying facts that have no relation to the, the human that created them or that is conveying them. And so one effort, one example of this type of video or effort is a video we made uh, back in 2015 as part of a campaign before the Paris Climate Agreement encouraging people to support it. And we're going to play a little bit of it. Carbon monoxide is an invisible gas, and it's poisonous, so we put ear-splitting alarms in houses to warn us of its dangerous presence. Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are also invisible gases. But without unignorable alarms in place, they've been allowed to cause rapid and dangerous changes to the climate, oceans, and ecosystems on Earth. Here's what that looks like for us, the Minute Earth team, where we live around the world. I'm Henry, and in the dry Rocky Mountains, drought and wildfires are becoming more frequent and more dangerous, so we're spending far more resources to protect our businesses and homes, and then far more days inside them each summer because the smoke is too thick to safely go outside. I'm Kate, and those same droughts in the Rockies mean that less water makes its way down the Colorado River, causing Lake Mead, which supplies water to me and 20 million other people, to drop to record low levels. So the video goes on to describe this for all the impacts on all of us as members of the Minute Earth team where we live, and goes on at the end to ask people to do something about it, rather than purely to learn about it, then to do something with that information and say, oh, contact your representative and ask them to support this deal. And another way to have our efforts contribute to making some sort of change in this, in this arena would be to get more political and become involved with projects that are happening outside of our particular channel and in the broader world. And back in 2016, we created a video uh, as part of one of the Democratic presidential debates that got climate change and US energy needs in front of 10 million people and a number of the leading Democratic candidates. And we'd like to play a short clip of that video. And it was the only question about climate change asked in the presidential Democratic primary debates in 2016. Luckily, there's far more this time around. Many Democratic voters are passionate about the need to do something to combat the threat of climate change, including the team of scientists from YouTube's Minute Earth channel. Here's their take. Hello from Minute Earth. Fossil fuels have long kept our cars moving and our light bulbs lit. But we now know that burning these fuels releases heat-trapping gases that are warming the planet, causing seas to rise and contributing to extreme weather events like South Carolina's devastating flooding last year. Fighting human-caused climate change means giving up our global addiction to fossil fuels and shifting the bulk of the world's energy supply to alternative sources. Some countries have acted decisively to make this transition, but here at home we still get a whopping 82% of our energy from coal, oil, and natural gas. In the US, political gridlock, pressure from industry lobbyists, and insufficient R&D have made an already tough battle against climate change even tougher. Senator Sanders, Americans love their SUVs. <laughs> so that's the question they chose to ask. Well, another way to try to make a positive change is to focus more directly on climate change in our videos. Well, they're focused on climate change tonight. They really only have made up maybe 20% or so of Minute Earth. 
Uh, but Alex last year helped to launch Hot Mess, a PBS-funded YouTube channel intentionally focused on catalyzing change around climate change. So Alex, please share a little bit of your experience with this with us. Yeah, so last year, um, I helped launch Hot Mess, which is a name that is very intended to capture the hot mess that is a rapidly warming and more complex Earth experiencing global warming. And it's also a term that is intended for young audiences and get them, try to get them to engage in this uh, in a way that they don't necessarily often engage. And Hot Mess was a hosted channel, whereas unlike Minute Earth, which only has stick figures as the characters in it, this has actual people on camera discussing. And that makes something, someone more relatable, because you can see that I'm moving around like this. But it also makes it a little bit less universal, because someone who is from a different country and doesn't move around the same way as me won't relate in the same way. And if we translate our Minute Earth video into a different language, they can see themselves more in that stick figure as they're hearing it in their own language. And so we made about 30 videos explicitly talking about how we address issues of climate change that involve um, the science of what's going on, how we adapt to it, and how it intersects with justice and environmental justice and other issues. And overall, the project, I think, was seen by about 3 million, uh, had 3 million views, excuse me. Um, and the co-creators and I learned a lot about it that we're putting into our current projects, as well as that are currently happening with Hot Mess, which is sort of still happening. I'm not involved in it as, as of this point, but there's still videos being put out about climate fiction and the complexity of climate change and how it's really harder for, hard for one brain to wrap itself around because it's such a complex, big issue that really interacts with all aspects of human society as one of the one sentence is described. And I want to show you a small part of one of the, the videos we made, just to give you a sense of a different type of um, creation that's still very similar in, you know, if you compare it to repairing, making a bow tie or repairing a, a car, sort of it's, it's still very close to what, what we make at Minute Earth. Imagine a world where you couldn't go outside for more than five minutes without fear of a serious sunburn, where skin cancer was a leading cause of death, and where crops withered and died under harmful radiation from outer space. We don't live in that world, but until the 1980s, we were on our way there, because unbeknownst to us, the substances we used every day were destroying the layer of ozone gas in the upper atmosphere that protects Earth from the sun's most damaging rays. What we did to avoid that terrible future offers a roadmap for how we could potentially handle a different atmospheric problem, climate change. And so that video goes on to make the analogy between the Montreal Protocol that ended up banning chlorofluorocarbons, the things that made hairspray work and that we used to keep our fridges working. Um, that also happened to destroy the ozone layer and cause the ozone hole, and that we successfully managed to get rid of those, and now we don't really use those as much, and that tries to take the lessons that we can take from that success story and apply them to the much more complicated issue of climate change. Now, we certainly didn't want to give you the impression today that we're the only ones that are trying to communicate about sustainability and climate change because there are many, many others, literally thousands out there doing it, probably including some or many of you. Uh, so we'd like to end uh, with a message which we think does represent simple, good, effective direct communication. And this is a, not a message we came up with. It's one that's evolved, that has bounced around the internet in at least a couple of dozen different versions. And the version I got was gotten from the internet by a colleague of ours named Joe Fargioni who shared it with us and we changed it yet again. Um, and so there's only four elements to this. It's about climate change. The first three are it's warming, it's us, and it's bad, meaning the world is warming, we're responsible, uh, and there are many negative and adverse effects. And there's uh, unequivocal data backing up all those claims. Luckily, the fourth point is that we can fix it. And there's equally unequivocal data suggesting we can do that. We have all the technology we need. And because actually slowing and eventually slopping, stopping climate change will save us far more money than if we don't because of all the avoided damages and because of the fact that renewables are just as cheap as fossil fuels now, 
We are going to do it. I'm convinced of that. Unfortunately, we're going to do it later rather than sooner, but the soonest it happens, the better. Um, and we know that helping people become aware of these issues and of how we can slow and stop climate change, which we do at Minute Physics, I mean Minute Earth and Hot Mist, is only a tiny, tiny part of the solution. Here's our to-do list. But we think it is, it is part of the solution, and that's why we're doing it. So thank you all for coming out tonight. We'd love to continue this conversation through Q&A session, which I think we have ample time for, as well as back uh, behind the barrier where there's, I believe, some delicious desserts. And we'd be happy to chat with you all individually after this, as well as to make a time to follow up or connect separately. So thank you all very much. The question down here. If you can. I was wondering if you've done any pieces on, at least in the United States, why attitudes about climate change seems to break along political fault lines. Oh, that doesn't intuitively seem like it would be connected to that. Yeah, it's a great question and a very strong trend. And we haven't done any videos like that in part because politics is complicated and you enter a very different realm when you talk about, when you try to single out individual groups of people, whether they're by class or gender or political party. And so as a whole, we've tried to stay away from that. That doesn't mean that our videos aren't more, uh, aren't gonna fall more within the lines of one particular party or another. Um, but personally, from what I've, what I've read and what I understand, the differences based on party that re re reflect belief, not, not just in climate change, but on the, you know, which, which de Democrats tend to believe much more so than Republicans, but also on the reverse where there are Democratic uh, regions of, of the United States that don't have nearly as much support for vaccination, which is just as proven or more proven than climate change as, as being a beneficial uh, part of uh, society. And the reason that those things differ is not necessarily anything to do with the science, but all to do with the identity of the individual. And so if I have to renounce my identity as a Minnesotan or something in order to believe what someone else is telling me is going on, if I have to renounce my identity as a Minnesotan or think I do in order to believe that climate change is happening, I might say, no, I'm a Minnesotan. Like, screw that. I'm not going to believe that, even no matter how much you tell me. And so some of that, what that some people say that means is that the way to try to discuss climate change and, and have these kinds of issues that have basis and make them more relevant for folks is not to hit them over the head with more facts, but to try to take a much more personal approach and say, how does this matter to you? What, what's important to you in your life? And oh, did you know that, you know, oh, you, you know, you like ice fishing or you like playing basketball or something. Did you know that well, we have you know, some, much less ice than we did in the past, and just leave it at that and say, you know, don't, don't necessarily say that has to do with climate change. We did make a video about how hard it is on your brain to think about climate extremes. Uh, and one last point about your question is, there's a, a professor here named Wendy Ron at the university who is an expert on this exact question, and it'd be great to get her to help us figure out how to make a script that would speak to everyone uh, and educate people about that. Yeah. Yes, back here. Given that your team is spread out so around the world, how did you first connect? That's a great question. So there's obviously a family connection at the very beginning. <laughs> and uh, my brother Henry knew a number of folks because he had started Minute Physics and was engaged in this, at this point, a very small community, maybe five five or so different types of <clears throat> channels creating this type of stuff. Um, he connected with a number of folks that way. And we've often connected just through random internet um, job ads or people we've met who we thought did really cool work. And so it has been very much a product of and a pr a, both in our team and then in terms of what we make of the distributed uh, thing that is the internet. Yeah, another question. Yes. 
I have two quick questions. One, your list of four things at the end. Why did you choose to say we can fix it rather than we can mitigate? Because I'm an optimist. OK. Um, it's also shorter. <laughs> and I thought of that too, yes. Um, there was a slide you went over quickly, I think, at the beginning. It was things not to do when you make a video, and you said, don't start with the Big Bang. Did I read that right? Did we have that? Let me see if I can find that slide. I, I just wondered why you said that, because I... Was it this one? A whole bunch of others. Yes, yes, that one. So, don't start with the Big Bang mean is shorthand, and I appreciate your question. It's shorthand for don't start explaining the origin of the internet as a thing when you're only talking about YouTube videos. So you don't need to explain how knowledge is created and, and shared in order to explain a certain, t a certain concept, basically. Okay. And you must have really been paying attention, because this was, we didn't leave this on for long, and it had the, all the stuff on it. <laughs> I'm working on a video that starts with a big bang. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can, you can start with that. That's yes. OK. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Hi, so uh, yeah, I'm, first of all, I want to say I'm a big fan, and I've been subscribing to both of these channels and all of the channels mentioned here since there were like a few hundred, few, few thousand subscribers. Thank you. So, so yeah, so I've been subscribing to these since I was an undergrad, and now I'm a graduate student here. Um, so, uh, I, I think you touched upon a very important question about like whether you should be educators or whether you should be activists, uh, and I have some 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 strong feelings about that. So as, as, a, as, an, as, a, as an intelligent, uninformed observer or consumer of this information, um, you mentioned talking about like, respecting the audience. So I think it's, a, it's, not, like, it's great to be either of them, but not both at the same time, and mixing them and confusing the audience. Right? So like, it's great to be an activist, or it's great to be an educator. But like, I would really want a source of unbiased information where I can go look at it and have an informed decision myself about what I think about the data, right? Uh, so assuming that, the, that you're talking to, the, to an intelligent audience, like here's a channel, here's a YouTube channel I can go to, I can trust that they're giving me the facts, and I can trust, so Kurzgesagt, for example, does a great job of like, often presenting uh, like a series of scientific facts, and then, then they'll separate it out and say, here's opinion ahead, like I'm gonna talk about our, like we are gonna talk about our opinions from now on. And, and, and I really appreciate that. I really am like, hey, you presented some facts to me. I'm going to think about that. And then at this point, what you personally choose to do with those facts, you're presenting that. And I may or may not agree with that. But I still have the decision or do myself to do that. right? So I really appreciate that when I see that in a, yeah. Yeah, in, in that's a place like a, a fantastic comment and a challenging thing to wade into because of a number of factors. One is that what we may think as fact, someone else may think as opinion. Mm -hmm. And as scientists, that's something challenging to deal with. Yeah. And all forms of knowledge Yeah, and, have and that I agree, problem. Like, as scientists, we can say that, hey, this is a scientific fact. But you, you could consider mm -hmm. a scientific fact as an opinion. But well, uh, in the scientific community, this is considered a fact. Like when, when, a, when, a, when a paper goes through a peer-reviewed publication, like it's a widely accepted thing. You can, you can like debate that later. But this is a scientific fact. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, here. Uh, sort, of related, sort of related to that question, uh, do, aside from the feedback you may get through the comments online or through your various partners and funding sources, do you try uh, testing your videos in front of test audiences the way that filmmakers and advertisers do? That is a wonderful question. And it's something that we wish that YouTube had more of as a platform. We're kind of bound to that in many ways. And there's nothing like A-B testing on it. However, we are our own test audience in that we're a large team of people who have diverse, diverse opinions and diverse understandings of, of, or interpretations of facts, and as well, diverse tastes. And so essentially, if, if we're able to make something that appeals to most of our team members, then we think it will appeal to lots of people in general. But if there are a lot of people on our team who say, oh, this is, this is not working. I don't get this, or I don't like it, that's kind of a big red flag. And so our, our families as well, we share a lot of our videos with them. And, they're also good test audiences. 
Yes. Uh, uh, you're both scientists. I was wondering, building on the previous comments, um, do you see a role for this kind of communication becoming part of science communication within an academic environment? In other words, ways to encourage scientists to engage a larger audience with their knowledge as their job is to generate new knowledge sure. and new understanding. Well, as a professor at the University of Minnesota, the uh, administration of this university has been coaxing, pushing, cajoling faculty to do outreach, which includes science information, science education, many, many other things for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and so there are many, many ways to do that. One could do it with small audiences in the neighborhood. One can do it with a you know, giant audience on YouTube. And so there's not just one solution to this. So I, I think my personal opinion is that as educators and scientists, we do need to reach out in as many ways as possible while still also trying to do the rest of our job. Uh, but not all educators, scientists, or professors feel that way. And not necessarily all institutional structures encourage that mm -hmm. in that tenure may not be based on, and I'm out of my league here for sure, <laughs> but tenure may not be based on your, the amount of people you engage with in a community of color. It may be based purely on how many papers you write. And that's a problem if you are looking at trying to encourage more engagement with folks. Another question. I don't know, how much time do we have? We have a couple more okay. minutes. Two more minutes, okay. Yes, question in the back there. And then one here in the front. I have a question about working with an audience you know nothing about, and how do you, one, build trust, and then how do you convey possibly empowerment or options and things they can do without becoming preachy or becoming, you know. Empowerment, you said, without being preachy? Right. That's a fantastic question. It's one that we struggle with all the time because we can see you here, but we can't see any of the people that were, um, have our, are watching our videos. And so in some ways, we don't really know them. And also given the way that the um, algorithms that control what type of information is fed to one type of person on the internet, which is itself a problematic uh, method of sharing information, we often default to the idea of what does our own team think about this and would we make, would, would the people that we know find this interesting? And as a result, we're making, our audience is very different than the one we imagine that we have. And so that's essentially what we try to do and we do try to heed to the idea of being clear on what we're saying and that by making the same kind of thing over time, people come to know that we have opinions and facts and types of stories we tell about lots of different topics. And as such, a video about drain tiles or the pipes that are underneath a bunch of fields, we might be telling something that's sort of based on facts if, be, um, and that they might be interested in watching that if we've made a video about bird evolution and they happen to be really interested in birds and we do a good job on that one. So we do know a little bit about our audience because YouTube does provide information, their best guess on gender and age, uh, and they can tell where they're uh, accessing it from so we know what part of the world. And we've been happy to have a wide range of ages represented in our viewership. And although not a majority, we have uh, more women viewers as a proportion of our audience than most science uh, video channels by far, and it's growing. And we're not quite sure why that is but we're happy for it. A couple more questions here. Hello, um, this is Sean Gashevsky back here with the Alliance for Sustainability. And I'll talk to you a bit afterward about, we'd love to have you guys help us make videos to help um, metro cities where they have citizen volunteers that want to help their city achieve the 40% carbon reduction by 2030 to break down the different actions that the cities can do and um, that residents can do so that it, it's a more hopeful pathway to see you can actually get to the 40 or 50 percent carbon reduction in 10 years. Right. Happy to chat afterwards. Yes. I think I might have seen this in your brief, you know, sort of postage stamps that went through showing some of you've done. But as you know, there's a lot of patently false information, propaganda, particularly in the, in, on the climate change issue. 
And have you taken on deconstructing some of those completely false arguments? That would be very helpful, I think. That is a very good question. And it's a minefield in terms of wading into it. And a lot of some, there, are, there are websites um, that do that, that do that very well. And there, it's, it's an entire approach. And there's also the concept of you can't necessarily fight fire but with fire. You can't, the more attention you give, it may bring more attention to that and raise it up more. And so there are, I would say on YouTube in particular, they're, they've partnered with Wikipedia to have sort of banners of sort of peer, uh, excuse me, public and peer reviewed information underneath videos that are on controversial topics, climate change among them. Um, and that doesn't necessarily solve the fact that on the platform they still allow disinformation and misinformation. And that's something that to some degree they are trying to work on. But it is really hard because the way that the platform is structured, they're not a news site. They're just a place that people can put things. And so if they were liable for every single thing that everyone put up, they'd have to shut down immediately because people, were, were, people are dumb. We put up stuff that we shouldn't put up. And some of that's you know unfactual. And so it's kind of a really tough situation where you have to balance freedom of speech and information and, and control and sort of what is, what is truth. And that's kind of a really weird, interesting place to try to police. But we're, we're working, there are some folks over at Yale that we've been talking with about exactly, how, exactly this question. How do, you, how do you best combat this issue? Do we have time for one other question? Final question? Yes, here in the back. This is just an immediate follow-up to what you said um, regarding the comment of addressing simply wrong you know, pieces of propaganda trying to really muddy the debate. And I think there's a connection here between whether to be an activist or an educator. The concern of being an activist by advocating for a particular position, but by failing to uh, correct disinformation, are you then failing to be an educator? And I'll stop there. Thank you yeah, very much. That's, that's a great question. We don't really have a perfect answer. I do want to say one thing about how we try to approach this whole issue of information versus advocacy. We attempt to point out and tell the story that the facts tell us what we actually understand scientifically, and then not say, oh, we should do this, but instead say, if we want to do x, then we probably should do y. And so maybe that's edging over the boundary for some people, but that's, in many cases, how we've tried to handle that. And with that in mind, if you would like to speak with us more, or if you would like to eat some desserts, you could go behind that barrier. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, uh, thank you both. You've given us much to think about and to view, and you ought to check out the statistics tomorrow. I think you'll see some rise in some of your videos. Um, a couple things before we close here. Uh, first, I want to tell you that we have two student groups from the Institute on the Environment. Uh, you'll see them on the sides of the hall with information of interest. Uh, please welcome the Sustainability Education Team and ACARA. Um, Peter uh, is on the Institute on Environment Fellow, and Alex is a visiting scholar. And before we close, I'd like to introduce Catherine Jordan, Chair of the Friends of the Library's Board of Directors. Oh, yeah. Thank you all very much for coming. This is a very lively d uh, discussion. Um, I see some friends of the libraries in the audience. I want to thank you for coming, and I want to invite many of you who are not friends to join us. Uh, with your membership, if you're at the $80 level, you get to have access to all the libraries on the university campus, which is a great resource. And I want to invite you to join us for the next Friends Forum. It's on December 9th. It's going to be a very special event. It's called The Secret Life of Libraries, which was specially written and performed by three veterans of the Prairie Home Companion, Sue Scott, Tim Russell, and Richard Dworsky. Tickets are on sale through the Northrop Ticket Office and selling quickly now, so don't delay if you want to join us. Thanks again for coming, and don't forget to join us for some refreshments. Bye-bye. <laughs>